Unfortunately, at some point, all of us have likely experienced it. It's that temptation to live out the saying, don't get mad, get even. Perhaps you have heard of the lady who went to the store. The clerk asked her how she wanted to pay, whether by cash, check, or charge. The lady fumbled through her purse, and that's when the clerk noticed a television remote control in her purse. And so the clerk asked, Ma'am, do you always carry your TV remote? She replied, No, but my husband refused to come to the store with me, and I figured this was the best way that I could get him back. The challenges we face tonight's lesson is really a a bold one, and it's a serious one, of how to do right when we have been wronged. We close out our study tonight of Romans chapter 12. We are in verses 17 through 21. Paul writes, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm pretty sure all of us at some point have been wronged. Fortunately for many of us, we have not experienced anything traumatic. Remember last week's lesson, we were talking about persecution. One of the realities of that is that uh, very few of us really have experienced any type of, of persecution, especially the level of which we read in Scripture. Now, it takes place in other areas of the world, but as for us, very likely that Few of us have experienced such persecution. The same would hold true when we talk about being wronged. We have experienced wrong. I'm sure all of us have on some level. Uh, But there is another level that reminds us of just how difficult some of us have it in the world today. I think about the family of Graham Staines. He served as a missionary in India for 34 years. In January of 1999, Graham and his two sons, ages 10 and 6, um, were mobbed by a radical group in that country. The three of them were trapped inside of their automobile when the mob set the car on fire. And the three lost their lives as they perished in the flames in that car. When their bodies were recovered, the three were holding on to one another. None of us can imagine the hurt that Graham's wife, Gladys, felt and their daughter. What I don't think that anybody was prepared to hear was her statement of of faith and of courage and of hope. Following the death of her husband and two children who had been persecuted, yes, this was a level of wrong that we have not experienced. Here's what she had to say. She said, I only have one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter, neither am I angry, but I have one great desire, that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who gave His life for their sins. Uh, Let us burn hatred and spread the flame of God's love. Everyone thought that Gladys and the daughter Esther would return to their homeland of Australia, but that was not the case. Instead, Gladys said, My husband and our children have sacrificed their lives for this nation. India is my home, and I hope to be here and continue to serve the needy. What a beautiful statement. What a powerful statement of how to do right when you have been wronged. Tremendous statement of faith. 
for that family and their service in striving to share the gospel around the world. I pray that none of us ever experiences anything like that. Still though, there may be times that we are wrong. So let's do this. Keep that story in perspective for us. And I hope, if anything, that it helps us that when we have been wronged, to make it easier for us to choose to do the right thing. So what we want to do tonight, this is our outline. We want to look at how we should not respond when we are wrong, and then we will look at how we should respond. We will really just continue to soak in those verses, Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. I think if we could sum up Paul's statement in how not to respond when we have been wronged, it would be this. Don't pay back wrong with wrong. Don't pay back wrong with wrong. Look at these scriptures again from our reading. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. Do not be overcome by evil. Three times in this short passage, Paul says over and over and over again, do not pay back wrong with wrong. Don't repay evil for evil. Do not take revenge and don't be overcome by evil. Now this theme is carried out in elsewhere in the New Testament writings. Paul also wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. The Apostle Peter wrote, remember we talked about this last week, in every chapter of that letter of 1 Peter, Peter addresses the idea of being wronged, of persecution, of suffering. He says in chapter 3 verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, Repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Again, that is his statement over and over. Uh, whether it's Peter writing, whether it's Paul writing, we see this theme carried out throughout the New Testament. Don't repay wrong for wrong. When we think about wrong for wrong, this is something interesting because some people really like to split hairs over this. Now, Johnny, are you talking about don't repay evil for evil, wrong for wrong? Or are you talking about taking revenge? Because uh, they're, they're, they're kind of the same thing, but there is a distinction. Okay, uh, Repaying evil for evil says that I want to hurt you to the same degree that you hurt me. In reality, what we see a lot in our society today is the desire for revenge, for vengeance, which also indicates it's not just that I want to pay you back for what you hurt me, but I'd like to pay it back with interest. So if we need to hear this, if we need to hear this, it all comes from the same idea. It's the fact that we have been hurt. Uh, perhaps it is, um, perhaps it's as simple as saying our pride was hurt. Uh, we want to restore our honor. But let me ask you this. I, I like this. I like this statement here. What happens when we pay back wrong for wrong? All right. You have wronged me, so I want to get you back, so I will wrong you. Well, I've set a cycle in motion because it's very unlikely that in our society today that if you've wronged me and I've wronged you back, that you're going to just let it be at that. It continues now a cycle that has been set in place. That's why you remember uh, hearing the, the, the phrase about old family feuds? That's exactly what caused stuff like that. It's what causes problems in churches where people go for years without speaking to one another. It's where they go. It's just this constant tension and conflict in the church because we decide that we want to hurt someone to the same level that we feel like we were hurt. All right, so how, how, what do we need to learn from this? Well, a couple of things about making sure that we don't respond this way when we've been wrong. Got a couple of ideas. Again, it walks through the passage. First of all is to understand this. Revenge runs contrary to what society says is right. Hang on. Hang on. 
Revenge runs contrary to what society says is right. Look at what Scripture says. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, I don't always see eye to eye with society. I'll be the first person to say that. But that there is something still that I see, at least hints of it, is society has a, a sense of fairness. We don't like to see innocent people hurt. But something happens when we see someone take revenge far and above what originally happened. That we look at that and we go, but that's not right either. There's a desire to pay back wrong for wrong, even worse to get revenge. But what we, what we come to realize, in fact, the problem is I think is that some, sometimes we're slow to learn this in society, is that revenge solves nothing. Do you hear that? Revenge solves nothing. So even in society, there is this, this sense of fairness. So we want to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now we're, we're going to expand on that a little bit uh, shortly, so hang tight on that. All right, second idea. Revenge does not promote peace, but incites men to hostility. I think that's important as well, that revenge does not promote peace. What did Paul say? If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. In other words, you do the right thing. You do the right thing regardless of what the other person does. Vengeance does not lead to peace. Repaying evil for evil does not lead to peace. All it does is it creates more conflict. It stirs up more conflict. It keeps that vicious cycle going of where we feel the need to get back the other person with a little interest, if you will. I think this is an important point, number three, that revenge usurps authority that belongs only to God. All right, let's look at Scripture. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but what? But what? Leave room for God's wrath. If you need more study on that, go back to our lesson this morning. Again, it came from Romans chapter 1. Uh, it's a hot topic in Scripture. Some 600 times that it talks about the wrath of God. God is a God of justice. God is one who ultimately will make things right. And when we step into that business of deciding that we are going to be judged, we are going to be the one that takes this into our own hands, we're taking a responsibility that God has taken. And, and that's usurping His authority. It, scripture says it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I'm reminded of this beautiful, powerful example that Peter puts in words in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 23, as he describes Jesus and how Jesus responded to persecution and how he responded to being wronged. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Remember this, leaving you an example you should follow in his steps. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered... He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We should follow in his steps. Jesus set an example for us in doing right when he was wronged. And that example tells us is that we need to do right even when we are wronged. Number four. Revenge succumbs to evil rather than overcoming evil with good. We know that from Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To take revenge, I like this in my notes, to take revenge is to respond to sin with more sin. 
Think about that and think about just how, you know, there are times I want to use the word just how silly that sounds because it's really what it is, but when it's in my world and it's my problem, I don't want to use the word silly. All of a sudden, I feel like it's my right, it's my responsibility to do that. But friends, it's wrong. It's repaying sin with sin. And it's not the wise way to act. It puts us, when we decide to do that, to repay wrong for wrong, evil for evil, it puts us on the same level as the person who wronged us. And remember this, paying back wrong for wrong doesn't do anything to help lead that enemy, the one who wronged us. It does nothing to help lead that person to Jesus Christ. All right, so four lessons under this idea of don't pay back wrong for wrong. Number one, revenge runs contrary to what society says is right. Number two, revenge does not promote peace, but it incites men to hostility. Number three, revenge usurps authority that only belongs to God. And then finally, we see this, that revenge succumbs to evil rather than overcoming evil with good. So that's how we don't do it, (laughs) all right? How do we then respond? How should we respond when we have been wrong? Again, we're just going to go back and look through these passages again because these passages provide a contrast. Don't do it this way, but do it this way. Don't do it this way, but do it this way. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. And then finally, overcome evil with good. I, I think that this is a, a I think this is an honest statement. That responding in this right way, maybe it's our sinful nature, but there's something about that responding in the way that scripture calls us to do is not our, our natural path. We see this. We see this in our world. What is our natural path? If you yell at me, then I'm going to yell back at you. Watch when, uh, watch in a baseball game when there's an argument between a, a coach and an umpire. Just yells back and forth. And there's parts of that that we look at that and go, man, that's pretty funny. Man, look, look at that. Boy, he pitched a fit, didn't he? So there's parts of that that we think are funny. But in all fairness, because of the example it's setting in our society today, uh, it, it's kind of lost its humor now, hadn't it? Because we live in a time where the natural tendency is if you yell at me, I'm going to yell back. Well, if you hit me, I'm going to have to hit you back. You hear that? If you, I'm going to have to hit you. Really? And we also live at this time that, well, you hurt me, so I, I'm just going to have to hurt you back. But it's not just evil for evil. It's not just wrong for wrong. It's... Now with the case of revenge, where we do so, where we add a little interest to it, we add a little extra hurt when we repay that wrong. Understand this. When we respond this way, this is not how the Lord would have us to respond. This is not what Scripture tells us to do. This is not how Scripture tells us to respond where we have been wrong. All right, so what do we need to know? Well, we need to know, first of all, doing the right thing when we have been wronged takes forethought. That means we have to make up in our mind before we're faced with that situation of how we will respond. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. We recognize the influence of our example. We recognize that others are watching us. They're watching us that as Christians of how we're going to respond when we've been wrong because it may be one of the greatest statements of faith that we will ever make. I think back to, uh, to Gladys Staines and, and her family and the statement that she made following the death of her husband Graham and those two sons. I, I think back of, of how just the powerful statement of faith that she made. What I'm convinced of is that in a situation like that, of the amount of faith that it took before that ever happened 
to be able to help her withstand that storm, that incredible amount of suffering that she and her family suffered. <clears throat> it takes forethought. The old American Standard Version says, take thought for things honorable. Take thought for things honorable. Give forethought. Think ahead of how we're going to respond and how we will act in the time like that. Because we want to live by faith. We want to walk by faith. And what that does is we're preparing ourselves to recognize that as Christians, Peter wrote this in 1 Peter, that we will suffer for the cause of Christ. And so we want to prepare us in forethought of how we're going to respond when we have been wrong. And as we grow in faith toward that, may God help us that when we face those difficult times that we respond appropriately. The second lesson, first of all, it takes some forethought. The second thing is that, well, when we do the right thing when we have been wrong, it may not always lead to peace. But that is our goal. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I can't control how someone else responds. We don't live in a vacuum. We live in a world that's filled with sin. So I can't, respond, I, I can't control rather what this person does or what that person does or this other person. What I can control is how I act and how I respond. So as far as it depends on me, I want to live at peace with everyone. And I've got to be prepared for this. I'm striving to grow spiritually, to prepare myself for difficult times. I know that it may not always result in peace, but as far as it depends on me, that's what I'm going to do. And then number three, it involves doing kind things. Now, this passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, it's, um, it, it refers back to an Old Testament passage in the book of Proverbs. Where it says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. A lot of ink has been spilled over that particular teaching. Well, what, what was Paul trying to say? Well, what was the wise man trying to say in Proverbs? And, and there are some that think that, well, what the original intent of that teaching is, is that, you know what, if someone wrongs you, and then you turn around and you do something nice for them, you're going to make them feel so bad. There are people that actually believe that. There are other people that actually believe that if you've been wronged and you respond this way, that you respond by doing the right thing, that, that God is going to get them. Is that it almost, it's like it heats up the punishment that God will provide them because of the way we responded. I just don't see uh, those two ideas uh, holding weight in Scripture. What I do believe is that our goal, we've been told in Scripture to, to love our enemy, to pray for our enemy and the one that, that, that hurts us. We've been told to share the gospel with everyone. That includes our friends. That includes our enemies. Uh, think back to the conversion of Saul to Paul. You talk about sharing the gospel with the enemy. He's the one that was breathing out murderous threats against the church. Paul, as he's writing this, he was an example of this. And it wasn't easy for all of them, was it? When, when, when the Lord got Saul's attention and he was converted to Christ, what, what did we see was that initial reaction? Well, the religious leaders in the Jewish faith, they wanted to then kill Saul. Paul, uh, he was like number one on their hit list at that point, but there were a lot of Christians that uh, they weren't real sure about him because he was the one that had been out to hurt them. But thank, thank God for men like Barnabas who stood by Paul's side and welcomed him into the fold. You see, that's where we do the right thing. We do the right thing. Was Barnabas affected by what Saul did when he was breathing out murderous threats against the church? We don't know. He could have been. But he still did the right thing. 
Was he aware of the trouble that Saul had caused the church before he became Paul? He certainly was. He had to be. But he still did the right thing. And that's something that we have to keep before us. When we are wrong, we have no greater opportunity to share the gospel with people that need to hear it than how we respond. How we respond and specifically how we respond to them. Now here's what I find really sad. I think back again, the story about the, the, the Staines family and again others like that. The stories like that that we hear are the exception to the rule. And what that tells me is just how few of us are really prepared to live out that teaching. I don't mean to be making a judgmental call. It may be that you've got this thing down and you know how to handle it and you do a great job when you're mistreated. And if that's the case, may, 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 you, be, may you be upheld and, and I encourage you and God gets the glory for the way that you handle yourself in faith. But there are others of us that struggle. We struggle. And so this is something we need to work on. And we need to, need to get a handle on this. That it, it, It's not just that we don't do the wrong thing, but that we do the right thing. And we do that because we know that we've got to prepare ourselves. It takes forethought. We know that. We also recognize that when we strive to do the right thing, it doesn't always mean that everything works out. You know, we just, everything's just fine. It doesn't always work out peaceful. We just do what we can. But we've got to learn how to treat people at a time that they treat us the worst. And we've got to be able to let our light shine its brightest. You see, that's where I think Paul is concluding this chapter. And he's doing so in such a way that he wraps up the entire theme of the chapter. Because he's talked about the whole time that he says, in view of God's mercy, Based on what God has done for us, this is how we're to respond. We want to live our lives for Him. We want to be sold out for Jesus. We have been transformed by the Lord. It has transformed our thinking. It's changed our thinking. It's changed the way we think about everything. And so let's let that show. Because we recognize now the importance of working in the church. We're part of the church family. We want to use our talents to the glory of God as we work together because we are a body of people working together with Christ Jesus' head. Then we also have talked about in these final verses uh, of last week and this week, we've talked about how we treat our friends, how we treat those that are close to us. But we also now are being reminded, if we're sold out for Jesus, it's not just how we treat the people that like us back. It's how we treat the people who have wronged us. The people who have... People who've hurt us. The ones that have caused pain and sorrow and heartache. How do we treat them? Well, if we're sold out for Jesus... We're sold out for Jesus. Then we are living in view of God's mercy. Amen. We have been changed. We have been transformed. And we want the whole world to know that we live for Jesus. And we can't just do it when times are easy. We let our light shine bright when it's easy. But especially, my friends, when it's hard when we've been done evil, when we have been hurt, when we have experienced that pain and that suffering, when we have experienced wrong because we stand for Jesus Christ. We want to don't, not overcome evil with evil, but we overcome evil with good.